Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, apologies, we're a little bit late, uh, but um, thank you very much uh, for sticking with us. Uh, a few technical issues, but we are here. And welcome to the latest episode of the Hard Compound Live. Um, if you have tuned in before, welcome back. Thank you very much. And if it's your first time tuning in, then welcome. And again, thank you very much. Uh, we've got some comments uh, which you can post. Um, if you uh, want to post any questions or just post where you're viewing from, please do. Um, if you're not sure what we do, um, one-stop shop for all things motorsport news, articles, backing for young riders. And we also do live interviews. Um, all of these are recorded, excuse me, uh, on our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash The Hard Compound, Twitter at The Hard Compound, and YouTube, The Hard Compound. That's three words, not one. <clears throat> um, who have we spoken to in the past? Uh, if you like your racing cars to have a roof on them, um, we've uh, spoken to the likes of um, Al uh, Alex Neville, Ryan Falkenbridge, and Bradley Gravitt from the Mini Challenge here in the UK. Um, from the BTCC itself, we've spoken to champions um, such as uh, Steve Soper, John Cleland, Rob Gravitt, uh, Matt Neal, all legends over here. Um, and of the current cropper drivers, we've spoken to uh, Michael Kreese, who's just moved to the Mobile One Porsche Super Cup on the Formula One uh, support series, which is absolutely fantastic for him. We've also spoken uh, to um, uh, Tom Coronel, uh, world touring car driver. Um, back in the BTCC, we've spoken to Jade Edwards, Ollie Jackson, Brad Philpott, um, Chris Smiley, Rick Parfit Jr. Uh, and Jake Hill. Uh, we've also spoken uh, with the legend that is uh, Dick Bennett of West Surrey Racing Team BMW, credited with launching the career of Mika Hacken and Ayrton Senna and the likes of him. We've also uh, spoken to um, um, Louise Goodman, who uh, is on the media side of things, used to work for ITV and F1, now works at the British Touring Car Championship. If you like your racing to have two wheels, we've spoken to uh, Bjorn Esman and Shane Byrne. We've also had a chat with uh, Mark Linscott uh, and his daughter Emily, who's out in the US from the UK in the USF4 Championship, making waves um, and doing very well. Uh, open, open wheel racers we've spoken to, um, we've spoken to Derek Warwick, who uh, XF1 driver, uh, winner of 24 Hours of Le Mans. Uh, we've spoken with Ari Leyendijk, two-time Indy 500 winner, and also we had the honour and the privilege of speaking with Mario Andretti back in February, um, which was absolutely fantastic. So if you like the sound of any of those, head on to our Facebook page or our YouTube, check them out, they're all on there. Um, we mentioned Mario Andretti. Um, our guest tonight has got a bit of a link to him. One of his most famous moments uh, involved Mario, which we're going to come to later. But um, he's F1 uh, driver of the past, IndyCar champion, Indy 500 winner. Uh, he's done some DTM racing. Um, he's done, uh, he's driven in the 24 hours of Le Mans as well. So we've kept you waiting long enough. Um, Please join me in welcoming a guest that I'm very excited to uh, bring in because I've been a fan of his since I was very young, Mr. Danny Sullivan. How are you, man? Here we are. Very good, Danny. How are you? I'm good. Can't complain. All excellent. Good. Excellent. Good to hear it. And we sorted out the technical hitch and we're all good. <laughs> yeah, my, my technical prowess kind of uh, delayed a few things, but sorry about that. No, don't worry. I'm I'm just as bad. This is all quite new to me as well, even though we've done this plenty of times. Um, so, uh, firstly, thank you so much for coming on and sparing uh, your afternoon. It is where you are um, and your evening here in the UK. Um, really appreciate you coming on for a chat. Well, thank you. It's, good. it's a pleasure. A lot of racing going on starting uh, next week. And with we had an Indy yesterday in the road course. Uh, that was a really exciting race. So, uh, be heading and what Monaco next weekend and then Indy the following weekend. So open wheel stuff, big time. Yes, we're being, uh, yeah, we're being a bit spoiled, which is, uh, which is excellent. And, um, I'm glad you mentioned, uh, the Indy, uh, road course yesterday. Obviously it was great to have a first time winner, uh, with Mr. VK, um, from Europe, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, uh, obviously you guys have had fans back at circuits for a while, haven't you? After what's been a bit of a, bit of a trying year. Well, it's they've they've had fans at a few. It depends over here on certain states. Some states are more difficult, more locked down than others, and a number of events have been canceled. But some states are opening up, and it's as our vaccinated population gets a, grows a little bit, 
uh, a lot of states are, you know, opening it up some. And it's funny because I've got somebody that's trying to come over for a NASCAR race from the Middle East. And uh, we're going to go to Texas for the all-star race. Um, his son's a big fan. And we won't know until next week uh, when they're down in Dakota what the, what the protocols are in Texas because it's, oh, wow. it's, almost, it's almost happening by the week. And uh, it's just changing all the time, I guess, isn't it? Because yeah, obviously, because it, it's so much different over there than it is here in the UK. We've got one law for England, slightly different for Scotland, and that's about it. You've got fifty odd different laws going on, haven't you? Yeah, but it all. I think really same thing for you guys. It has to do with the number of people vaccinated. And I saw yeah. that they've canceled the, or postponed the Turkish Grand Prix because uh, the UK red flag people in turkey so all the teams would have had to quarantine to come back yeah and and it happened it actually happened to me last year uh doing the f1 driver steward job i couldn't come back i could go there and i had passes to get into almost every country but to come back to the u.s i had to quarantine for two weeks and it just it just wasn't feasible feasible for for what my life was doing and what was going on work-wise no uh, sure sure it, and as you say, you know, it's made things a bit, you know, difficult for in, international transit. And obviously, there was a time where we didn't have any motorsport at all, which was, you know, which, which was the worst kind of world in my book. Um, you know, yeah. we all need motorsport going on. So it's great that it's that it's sort of, you know, that, that it's back, and we've got, you know, people certainly on your side of the pond being able to go back racing, and we're going to be able to go back in just two or three weeks. So uh, yeah. yeah, here's to the end of a difficult time. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't seem like it's. It seem, doesn't seem like it's changing, but I know uh, Goodwood Festival Speed seems to be on track, and uh, yep. hoping to come across for that. And you know, uh, you know, slowly but surely we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, we'll be glad to see the back of it. Um, so we can, let's get back to some normality. Um, <clears throat> so um, as I said, uh, I, you know, I'll like send you a few notes and things we can talk about and things. But um, for those of you who's not tuned in before, we uh, we like to keep it fairly um, fairly relaxed, nothing okay. too stuffy and rigid and stuff like that. Um, and we just like to have a chat, basically, over how it all started for you and your career, and one or two notable moments which will which will come to um, that you've spoken about a hundred times before. But apologies. Um, so. Um, how did it all start for you? Because you were, um, you know, you, you were like born in Kentucky into a fairly normal family, I guess, weren't you? And yeah. when did you first get the get well, interested in motorsport? I, it, it's uh, an Englishman, believe it or not. There was a guy that that um, uh, the older crowd would maybe remember a guy named Dr. Frank Faulkner. He was a doctor. He used to race. Uh, ju Formula Juniors against John Cooper before they actually had a Cooper Formula Junior. So that really dates dates Frank. And they became best friends. And then Frank realized, he said, I'm not any really good at this. So um, he started doing timing and scoring and going to races and so forth. And then he, he was transplanted <coughs> over to the United States for medical business. And uh, his son and I were best friends at school. And I used to go out like you do, have a sleepover at your friend's house and this and that. And Frank had automobile year, auto course, and he had walls of pictures with, you know, Sir Jackie Stewart and Jack Brabham and Bruce wow. McLaren and Graham Hill. And I would just read these books. And ironically, he had the last ever um, uh, Mini Cooper S that was brought into the United States in the in the original ones, the, yeah, yeah. the small ones, 19, whatever, 65. Yeah, 65. the proper ones. Right. And so <laughs> then we, we separated. He got transferred other places. And uh, I'd kind of dropped out. My fallen out a little bit with my family and was bumming around in New York. And my family saw him someplace and said, would you mind seeing if you could track down Danny and talk him into, you know, maybe returning to school? And when he did, uh, we got talking, we became good friends, and I talked him into going racing, and he didn't really want to do that because so many people, he had lost so many friends over the years. And uh, Sir Jackie Stewart said, well, let's send the lad up to Jim, that being Jim Russell, and find out if he's got any, tal any talent. 
So for my right. birth, for my 21st birthday, I got sent to the Jim Russell School up in Snetterton. And, yes. Jim, and Jim was still active. Patrick Neve was a member of Patrick Neve, the Belgium driver. The guy yeah. He was my instructor. Wow. And so that's how it, it all started. And I, you know, fell in love with it. And they said I had some talent. So to be honest with you, I think the school tells everybody that. So you'll keep coming back to them. But, but it was good for me. It was good news for me. And that's really where it started. And then unfortunately, Frank was a, an academian. And I, you know, I was working as a waiter and doing odd jobs and so forth. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, cash in the kitty to go racing. So it was a I was one of those overnight 11 year sensations and you know i've had some success and but you know what i, I tell you this i wouldn't trade it um all the years uh, in england and meeting people and, and making connections and longtime friends from guys like chris witty and ian phillips and because they were all at autosport at the time and i lived not very far from them so you know there was some nights at the pub and you know, it just was that whole family ambiance and getting to know people. And uh, and then that's the rest is kind of history. But that's no. how it all started. No, that's cool. And I tell you, I've got in the notes and the research we've done, obviously, um, I sort of knew this a few years ago about Snetterton, but I thought it's not the kind of, it, w it wouldn't be the the automatic starting point for someone who was going to go on to be an Indy 5, yeah, like an Indy 500 winner, an Indy car. Well, but let's not forget, <laughs> Jim had that school and then he had a branch. They'd take some cars and they'd go to Mallory Park. Yeah. Jim was very active. Emerson Fittipaldi had come through there a year or two before me in a Formula Ford and went on, you know, so it wasn't, there was a lot of kids that were in, kids, people that were in the school that one guy was a merchant seaman and one that they were just doing it as like this was their busman's holiday type thing. I want to, I want to try driving. And there was a couple of us there that were trying to see exactly what I hated. We'd like it. I'd never, I'd never been to races. I'd never gone to races. I'd never driven a race car. So did we like it? Um, did we have any talent at it? And, uh, and, and Frank and Jim knew each other from a long time, Dr. Faulkner and him. And so it didn't matter what I was going to say. Jim was going to have a very candid conversation with Frank. And luckily it worked out that he said something. But, uh, you know, the hard part, and it's still the same thing today, um, is, okay, you, somebody's got some talent, whatever. You still got to take the right steps, and you need to have some find some money or have some money behind you to get there. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tough road, um, you know, for everybody. And that, that is, that has nothing to do with nationality. That's the problem for, that's a universal problem. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's the same road for everybody now as it was, uh, when I was doing it so many years ago. Yeah. And it's never going to be a cheap, you know, it's never going to be a cheap thing to get into. No. Um, <clears throat> Just to rewind a bit, I mean, so you'd never actually gone and done any racing before you came over to Snetterton. It was just, no. wow. Well, That's when, crazy. well, when we decided that I was going to go, um, I had never been to a race. And so Frank took me to, to Daytona 24 hour um, to, to just to see, because he had to go down there for some business and to see what it was like. And I went to, this is when I met, um, Jackie Stewart, Sir Jackie now, but he was just Jackie back then. Yeah. He at the Questor Grand Prix. Do you remember when they had that at Ontario Motor Speedway, cool. where they had in yeah. 1971, 71, they had Formula One against it with Formula Five Thousand cars. Right. And yeah. and Jackie yeah. and Ken Tyrrell had brought over a car, and I'd gotten to know Ken through Frank there, and he said, "Hey, you're coming over." to do the Jim Russell school, is that correct? And I said, yeah, he said, well, come a couple of days early and stay with me. And that's how, but it was not because it was me, it was because it was it was Frank. And I was Frank's, you know, um, protege, if you like, or just the guy that he was gonna help. And that's how, and I got to know Ken and Nora and everybody very well and, and Sir Jackie, you know, and Helen over the years. And this was before they had kids. 
I mean, remember this was remember this was 1971. Right. You weren't around in 1971, I'm guessing. Oh, I was still 10 years away. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you you see my point. So it just yeah. shows I don't just look old. I am old, you know. So, but the <laughs> but the but the point is that that um, uh, that so in that era. But I had never gone to I'd never gone to a, a, a real a real races until that time until we. Wow. Met that's so, amazing. So Just, I didn't have the background. My father hadn't taken me, you know, like so many kids, and I envy them. It's not uh, that's not being uh, negative. I just envy all the kids that grew up doing it. And uh, there's, yeah. there's there's so many. There's hundreds of thousands that have started in um, you know in like carts when they were yeah. three, and yeah. uh, or they got into it when they were nine or ten. Yeah. But, um, you know, and some people, you know, well, we spoke with um. Um, a guy called like Rick Parfit Jr. He's in the British Touring Car Championship. He's done the British GT, and he's the son of the status quo guitarist Rick Parfit. Right. And he said that he got into motor racing by racing go karts in the back garden, and he beat Brian May from Queen in a race. <laughs> um, that's uh, that was one of the weirdest backgrounds we've heard. But um, while we're on the subject of uh, backgrounds, this is something that I've always, that's always uh, intrigued me. We're going to get onto the racing very shortly. Um, you had some very sort of what you'd say like normal jobs. You worked as a lumberjack and things like that. You were famously you worked as a New York taxi driver. Now was that in like Manhattan in the yellow cabs? Yeah. And yeah. That's I've just got this image of you just because on the grid system just slinging the car around. And well, there was, <laughs> obviously there was it didn't little, happen, but yeah, but there was a little bit of that because when I when I dropped out and was bumming around before Doctor Faulkner came, I was working in New York, and the only two jobs you could get was cab driving was easiest because they were short of drivers um, and the second was was waiting tables and I, they were hard to get and so I got the cab driver and then not long after the waiting table came and after a while the cab driver thing was was pretty dangerous at that time and and uh, a lot of robberies and so forth and I just thought I'm meeting more people as a waiter than I'm in with somebody jumping in the back of the car saying take me to you know Da, da 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 So I just, you know, stopped that and you know, it was one of the things I knew how to do. But in those days too, when we dropped when I dropped out and we this buddy of mine and I were, you know, trying to find what we're gonna do in a way in life, we wherever we ended up, when we ran out of money, that's why we got a job. And that's why the Adirondacks Mountains and I worked on a chicken farm and and uh, just all kind because of, we'd run out of money and we go Hey, um, we don't have enough money to fill up the car with gas. What are we going to do? So we'd find some some job to go get and make some bucks and move on. And go and, and uh, yeah, and go racing. So <clears throat> amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I, I've, yeah, because I've only been to New York once um, three years ago, just before my first daughter was born. It last little blowout holiday, and as soon as I saw a yellow cab, but this is quite weird, and it might. Freak you out a bit, but as soon as I saw a yellow cab, I thought, I'm sure Danny Sullivan did this because that's how my brain works. It just goes yeah. like motorsport all the time, and I thought that would have been so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure all my passengers love the speed at which I drove around. The <laughs> but, but there you go. There you yeah, go. certainly. Yeah, uh, would have been fun. Um, so you've come over and you've done the um, you've done the uh, you know, the school of racing at Snetterton, went back to uh the states as i understand it and was it in 1980 and 81 you went into the can-am series yeah. um so, so just to clarify when i came over i stayed and did the, <coughs> i went back for a really short period of time uh to try to raise some money and came back and again through ken tyrrell and Vern schupin's help they they figured which car was probably the best one and Vern did more of that than ken but ken asked Vern to do it and I ended up with Eldon, and then I came back and I raced Formula Ford, Formula Three, Formula Atlantic, uh, yep. a couple of Formula Twos, and that's before I went back. So I was there from '71 to '78, right? And then, I, oh, and, then I back, okay. and then I went back and did Atlantic, and then it all fell apart. And then I, I eventually found uh, a backer in Garvin Brown, 
who's no, no longer with us, but he was the heir to Jack Daniels and early times and Booth Clico and all that. Oh, Brown, okay. Brown Foreman Distillers. And he said, come on, I'll, I'll help you out because he wanted to be in the deal. And that's where the Can-Am started back. That's where it started while it was 80. So my end of 78 to 79, it was pretty bleak. Was right. Really okay. Well, until and, uh, until that happened, and then the dream was kind of alive again. I get, I suppose. Yeah, and um, some success started happening and bounced here and there. And, but you know, it's it's um, you know, it's never a direct easy path. Or I thought it was not. I mean, for some people, yes, but but for for my my route was not that way. So no, sure, Sean. Sure. I've just got a note here. You said you raced along uh, alongside the likes of. Um, um, was it like Teo Fabi, who obviously did F1, yeah. went on to do IndyCar, and um, Al Holbert, what a legend, yeah. what a legend. And Jeff Brabham, you know, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, some pretty cool people. Um, yeah. And for those of you tuning in, by the way, um, just remember the name Brabham, we might have something coming up. Um, but And you won the last race of the season um, in Vegas that year. Uh, in 80, was it 81 or 80? I can't. Uh, it was, years, it was, was 80, it? I think it was 81. I yeah, won the last race in Vegas. Um, I've got the note. And the following year, um, you made the switch to IndyCar. Um, how did that one come about? Um, I had been asked by Jerry Forsyth um, that if I did, I want to come along and try it. And uh, he put together a deal with Garvin for me to do a couple of races. And, um, and the first race I did for him, believe it or not, was Road Atlanta. And I remember a story, if right, you guys exactly. don't mind me. Uh, sorry, I said Road Atlanta, at Atlanta Speedway. It was an oval. I'd never been on an oval or, or in an Indy car on an oval particularly. Wow. But, and I was out, trust me, I was out to lunch. I was no good. I couldn't figure it out. And I'm literally, they're lined up for qualifying out in the pit lane, big pit lane. And I'm lined up and I'm coming out of the portal can going to, 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 to get in and I see Al or Sr. And I knew Al from Can-Am. And so I said, I said, Big Al, I said, I'm completely lost. What, what, do, what, do, what do I do? And he says, well, you're making the classic road racer mistake. When you come down to the first corner or to the corner, you lift off the throttle, ease it down in the corner. When you get everything settled, you pick up back up the throttle. He said, on these things, you got to carry the speed down into the middle of the corner. You drive it down into the corner using the banking, everything to get the car load and then pick up the throttle as fast as you can coming off. So he said, tell Wally Dollenbach, he was a chief steward. He said, tell race director. And he said, tell Wally, you want three warm up laps. Try it on the warm up laps at, you know, obviously not at race speed, right? Ease your way into it. So I did. And I ended up qualifying 10th, and uh, which was was a huge jump because I think I'd been last or close to last in every practice session, and I actually finished third in my in my first race. Yeah, I've got and, yeah. And, and so, but but it was, and then I did Indy, and we had a problem, got tangled up in somebody's accident, and then um, then heck, remember the name Hector Rabake? Hector Rabak, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drove for. Well, he came to the Forsyth with a bunch of money, and I was gone, and because they, you know, and I, I look, it's it's money business, talks, and money talks, and but it gave me the taste of the IndyCar, and then the next year I went and did Formula One. But that was my, um, you know, it's it's IndyCar is tough, particularly the ovals, especially mm -hmm. if you don't have any any uh, experience on. And back then. They used different than they're doing right now, but they used to use lockers in them so the cars didn't turn like they would. And you'd run right. a big stagger on the right side. They'd run a stiffer spring on the right side. You know, it's changed over the years where the cars are a little bit more adaptable without a major setup from oval to road course. There's some changes, don't misunderstand me, but it's not, they were pretty drastic back then, the change. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but a lot of, anyway, we adapted and, and the rest is came out okay. Yeah, it sort of seemed to go okay a few years later, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, but you um, know, but there's never, but 
but to be fair to almost everybody. And I, so I'm not any different. You know, there's steps and you go up and you think, okay, I've done well, I want a racer. And then something falls apart or a sponsor drops away and you get back down and you go back up. It's, mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, it's a tough business, and but that's the way it is. Yeah. I and mean, just, on, just on that, I mean, we mentioned just off air where we've spoken to um, uh, Steve Soper. And I think it was him who actually said, you're always scratching around for money and everyone in their career has got a and then I met moment yeah. and then it, that's when it all took off. So it sounds like it was a similar kind of thing. Um, so you've done a bit of Can-Am, you had two Indy car races and 83, you end up in F1 um, yeah. at, um, at uh, Tyrrell, which, um, yeah, that must have been a bit of a, a bit of a leap from where you'd been and straight well, into F1. Yeah, but remember my my goal, having started in in the UK and Europe with Formula Ford, Formula Three, Formula Two, my goal was really to go to Formula One. Yeah. And there was an opportunity came largely, I think, I mean, okay, I knew Ken, but largely because of Benetton, they were trying to get bigger into the US market. Yeah. And Ken tested a whole group of us down at Paul Ricard. And there was um, Stefan Johansson, Bebby Gabbiani, all, all the big stars of the time in wow. European Formula 2. For, they were all, I think there was like nine or ten of us that got invited for the test. Oh, wow. and, um, and I can tell the story now. It was quite funny. And we got there and Ken had invited and I'd gone over early to, and Garvin had come with me and, and uh, the, the Brown Foreman heir and he had come with me and and uh, I got down there and I mean, I knew Ken really well. I mean, I, I lived in, the, in, in his house with Ken and Nora for three months. I mean, so I knew him, I knew him well. And yeah. he, he gives me a contract before I'm gonna get in the car, which I think he gave to every one of the drivers. I don't think I was singled out for anything. And he gives me his contract and I'm reading it and it's going uh, this amount of money, first year, second year, third year, and it was kind of like, uh, and I have to pay my expenses to get to the races. And I'm thinking, I, I, I can't even cover my expenses to get to the races and do the races on wow. what he's paying me. So I asked him about, you know, what can I put sponsorship on the helmet or something like that? Can I get a patch on my suit to try to raise, you know, some outside money? And he said, no. And, uh, wow. and so Garvin, so I'm getting changed. I'm getting out, literally, I'm getting out of my suit. And Garvin's going, what's going on? I said, well, well look at the contract. I said, I, I just got it. I said, I can't afford to, to, to live on that. He says, and Garvin says, don't worry, if, if you get the deal, this is not a big confidence booster. If you get the deal, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay everything. And I thought, wow. okay, cool. So I went out and... Uh, I, I was consistently quicker than everybody all the way through from the 10 laps. So, but I didn't get the drive. I got invited to come down and test in Brazil. Remember, they used to all go down there, the Formula Ones were Goodyear, and they'd do tire testing for eight days. Yeah, was that down in Rio? Was that the Rio? Yeah, so it was in Rio. Yacarapago, or however you, whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I got invited and, and the test went. And I got, and he gave me, I stayed down there for, I was there for like 10 days because I wanted to be acclimated thinking, hey, I'm going to go test in Formula One down in Rio, right? <laughs> I stood there and watched everybody test for friggin' eight days. And then finally he says, okay, jump in. They put a set of standard compound tires on. And that was when they used the qualifying tires. Yeah. And, and so at the end, I got three laps on the B compound. And then they said, oh, we got a U set of of uh, qualifiers for you to try and it was like a U set not a new set but a U set of, wow. Mika- of Michele Alvarado's tires and I went out and I was only a couple of tenths off of what he had done wow the deal. and when I got a car it was typical Ken he said well you selected yourself and that was it that was it right <laughs> off the bat wow you know but I mean I went down there for 10 days and did five laps you know but but that was just it was wow. but, but you know if you think about it, if you think about it nowadays, because there was no 
there was no i racing series there was no uh, simulators you know you yeah. couldn't gain the, the deal you know i mean in those eight days by the way i stood on every corner every section of that track watching what other people were doing their lines what they were doing a little bit with gears you know what they you know just trying to learn what it was and again i'm not simulators are fabulous i'm not this is not i'm not knocking anybody that's got it but it just goes to show that even back then, you didn't get, you know, days and days and days and days of testing. Yeah. You know, it, it, McKaylee did, but he was already established. Okay. Yeah. They, you know, and uh, and so it was just a it was just a great experience. But it also showed that when you got the opportunity, you need to, you know, get out there and stand on the gas and go for it. And yeah, you had to grab it. Yeah. And you had to deliver it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very similar thing we saw over here on Sky Sports. There was a chat with um, um, there's like Willie T. Ribs when he did his um, his Brabham test, and he said the same thing. He said he went and stood for two days on every corner and just tried to see what they were doing before he got in the car, and it still frightened the hell out of him. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, do you rem do you remember when Jeff Gordon swapped with Juan Pablo Montoya at Indianapolis? Oh, yeah. Remember they did a thing. Where Montoya, I think, was driving for BM, uh, for uh, uh, Williams BMW. Oh, Williams, yeah. Williams BMW. I'm pretty certain. And uh, and the, there's a really funny backstory to that because Jeff goes in there and they, you know, they got this whole deal set up. I mean, everybody's recording it, the whole thing. And they're there the whole day. Montoya drove his Jeff's car, his, his uh, Hendrix stock car, and Jeff drove his formula one car and total laps from his out lap to when he finished jeff drove that car nine laps and he and he got it and he was only one second off of montoya wow okay and montoya was a second off of jeff i mean so two very talented guys needless to say but nine laps and and jeff had gone through um he'd done the final of his divorce papers that night at midnight and had not slept very well, got there and drove. And I said to him, how did you, how did you, I mean, cause the breaking alone is, is mind boggling. So it would take, yeah, I said, how did you do it? He said, uh, I did it all on a simulator, on a game. He learned, he said, I learned the line, the breaking point, everything on, on a game, on a, on a, and this was early on. I mean, the Sims now wow. are, are, you know, like real. But yeah. this was back in the day when it was a pretty, not basic, but they weren't what they are today. No, and, absolutely. And wow. he said, I learned all the breaking points, everything on the Sim. Wow. That's, that's incredible. I can't believe that. You just second off. That's, wow. Yeah. But Amazing. do you remember, but do you remember um, Jimmy Johnson drove in Bahrain he drove the mclaren mm. isn't that right it was the mclaren i, I think it was mclaren yeah yeah yes. and down there and he 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 did a good job he's finding yeah. it a little tougher in, in indy cars right now but he's doing yes. he's getting there and he's making he was yesterday in the race he was he was way behind but he was doing the same times as montoya and a bunch of other guys so he was on par with the the lap times anyway so yeah anyway. yeah he's getting there and he will i mean you know yeah. he's you know he doesn't achieve what he has achieved by by not being very good <laughs> no. i think i think it's anything um i think great race drivers will find a way to do well in a, in a race car if you give them enough time to to adapt yeah and, definitely it yeah. takes time it takes time yeah. so i well i imagine i'm not a racer but yeah, yeah di but different disciplines different disciplines you know? yeah absolutely um just going back to the F1 year, um, you mentioned um, um, uh, Mr. Al, Al, Alberetto. Um, he actually took pole in the first Grand Prix qualifying ever went to in 88. Uh, or I think he came, I, th I think he put it on second, the British Grand Prix in 88. And uh, when he was at Ferrari, um, obviously very sadly no longer with us. He was killed uh, wasn't right. he, what, odd years ago. Um, just a few words on, on him and your memories of him. First of all, McKaylee was just a, he was a fantastic teammate, very open. There wasn't any, you know, any hiding anything or we've got a set up or anything like that. But clearly when I joined the team, McKaylee was already a, a race winner. So he was clearly the number one and I was the, 
I was the number two, which was what it should have been. Um, but he was a fabulous teammate. He was, uh, um, you know, he was very honest. He was a very nice man, you know, yeah. and obviously super quick. And I'll, uh, ironically, uh, I had been asked, I mean, as I said, I'm quite a bit older and I'd been asked, I'd been kind of out of it to drive. There was a, there was a group over here. I think it was over here. Somebody had it, but they had a deal on one of the Audis. Okay. The R8. And I'd been asked to drive this thing. And, uh, I called McKaylee and I said, you know, tell me about it. Are these things really hard to drive? Does it take a long time? You know, some cars are just, you just get in them and they're, they're very adaptable and you'll have no problem with that. But I've been out of it for a little bit of time. And I really would have liked to going back with something that could win, uh, you know, win out right there. So, and I knew that was a stretch with a factory team. And he yeah, said, sure. yeah, I'll be careful. These things are not there. It's not, it's not all easy. It's, it does, it's not as easy as thing. And two days later he was killed. Yeah. Was it Germany? Was it, yeah. It was, uh, he was testing it. Uh, the, was it uh, Avis or something like that? Oh, was it Avis? Avis was it Avis? Yeah. Avis. He was testing it. Avis yeah. Had a tire failure at, at 200 miles an hour or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. And didn't so, make it. Yeah. And so, by the way, and, and I mean, I, I I remember calling the team right after I found out and just said, "Hey, I'm not 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 interested in doing it," you know, because it just. You know, if, if McKaylee, who was on his game, I mean, he was, you know, he was a contender in those things everywhere he went. He was on his game. He was current, you know, and, you know, stuff can happen. It's still, it's still motor racing, unfortunately, for, for some of the results that can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously very, very, very sad. Gone, gone far too soon. Um, um, just a quick word on that year in F1. Um, Obviously, there was um, seven retirements, unfortunately, but obviously the the highlight, I guess, was the fifth place in Monaco. Um, pretty right. cool place to get points. <laughs> uh, well, it was cool, and I think for a lot of people who don't aren't uh, that don't know that far back, points only went to sixth place. Yeah, uh, yeah. At, at that time, it was nine, wasn't it? Nine, six, four, three, yeah, two. three, yeah. two, one, and uh, so it was, it was cool. But I tell you what was special. And this is again how Monaco, because you know you do the, you know the Thursday, you got the Friday off, qualify Saturday, and race on Sunday. And um, I think it was John Watson and Nikki Lauder were both in the McLaren, and I had had a good uh, uh, practice and everything like that. Then it rained out the, it rained out the qualifying, the second qualifying, because I remember they used to do it more than once, and yeah. they didn't get. The two Marlboro McLarens did not get in the show. Yeah, I saw they didn't. I was when I was having a look back. Obviously, I was. Well, sorry to bring this up. I was two. Um, yeah, don't, don't worry. It's so it's okay. I mean, I can um, I'll call you names when we get off there. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but 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 to start but when last, did the research, I saw they hadn't qualified. I thought, wow, yeah. crazy. And then and then the point that I was going to make is that it it was raining. I mean, it was raining, and I'll tell you a couple of significant. And because I was last, I'm on the outside of the the grid, so I'm out. It's not under the trees along the front straightaway. You're on the outside, right? right. So I'm on the outside, and I remember Elio DeAngelis was in the John Player special, and and Ken came up to me and said, "And it's raining. I mean, it's not just wet. It's you know, it's still now. It's not pouring. Okay, so we're not in a monsoon. Okay." But it's still raining, and he comes up and he goes, "Ken, uh, typical Ken says, which, which you want slicks or wets?" And I'm about to answer, and he said, "I thought so, so we'll just start you on slicks." And and remember, they didn't do pit stops then; they weren't set up the way they do pit stops now. They weren't set up for that. When if you made a pit stop, it was a once the race started. If you made a pit stop, it was usually because you had a, a problem. Okay, and they didn't have the quick release big. Big nut. It was a it was a single, but it was one and you know torque wrench and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Down. So I'm about to say something. And he just walks off, and I remember Elio D'Angelo's, who's on wets. He looked over at me and he kind of goes like this, 
are you crazy? He's going, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and I was like, but Ken said to me, he said, well, it's going to stop raining. And so I got off and I went down and I got through the first corner. You know, okay. And I got, and then there was a off with somebody that slid off or something. And I got around at the end of the first lap and I thought, well, I, I, I felt like I was going so slow, which I was on the slicks. But I'll tell you how good Keke Rosberg was. So he started on slicks in the, he was in the Williams, okay? He started on slicks, Prost was on wets, and Prost was a really good wet driver, really good. I mean, the professor was known to be, and he was driving the turbo reno. And Keke outbraked him into the chicane on the first lap on slicks. Oh, God. That's you know, um, brave. And, yeah, that, brave, but also it's a great talent. I mean, Very great skillful, talent. yeah. And Keke, you can just hear him. I mean, if you knew, pop, 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 pop on the throttle. He was always dancing on the throttle. Yeah, know? yeah. And uh, and so, but to come all the way back from that and and you know keep it off the the big thing for me was uh, was just keeping it off the fence and then going fast enough a, as it dried out. And by the way, Ken was right. Twenty something laps into the race, it was dry, and all those guys on slicks were just you know so. Uh, yeah, give, give him credit, but uh, yeah, he called it. Yeah, yeah, but it yeah. was not. Uh, and I had us, even though it wasn't a non championship race, I finished second battling with Keke in the non championship race prior to that uh, at Brands Hatch in the race of champions. Yes, he, he, and I, he and I banged our way around on the last lap a little bit, but uh, yeah, um, and he and I know Keke and I have known each other. We raced in Atlantic together, Formula Two together, Can Am. He was in Can-Am some, not much, but we, we raced over the years. So it wasn't like uh, there was any surprises for me to one of us. So. Yeah, sure. Anyway. Well, you kind of knew each other. Yeah. yeah. So good uh, times. Cool. Good times. A lot of memories. Brilliant. In fact, I just saw something some from anti-reformed Keke, and they I, I can't tell what it is. I'm, the way we were on the technical, I'm afraid to click on it because I'm afraid I might lose the screen or something. Yeah, I'm just saying. I'll, I'm let, just saying, I'll um, let you do uh, it. I'll let you I do just it. want to say that, guys, for tuning in. We're only getting some of the messages through from Facebook, so uh, you know, we might be a bit delayed, but we'll try and get to them. I've just seen someone about the age thing. Uh, Bailey Marie Terry. She says, "I'm I'm going to call him names now, Brat. <laughs> Give us all a moment of youth." <laughs> Sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah, <laughs> that's not fair. Yeah, don't I'm worry. Coming up, but here we go. Um, right. So, um, at the end of uh, eighty three, um, I've had a couple of rumors. Uh, was there an offer to stay at Tyrrell? Because I've heard rumors that Roger Penske waved more money. <laughs> no, well, I didn't. Um, try which I'm not sure if that's true. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> well, I didn't drive for Roger the first year I went back. So remember, 1983. Of course, yeah. And I went, I was going back home and I'd been in Los Angeles and I lived in Colorado and I was going back home and I stopped at Phoenix for the final uh, IndyCar race of mm. the season. And I saw Doug Shearson, who we've, we've now lost, um, but one of Ari's wins was with Doug. And, and yeah, 90, and, yeah. And, and Doug was brilliant. I mean, I really close with he and the family and everything. And he said, look, Howdy's going to retire and, and join, go back to the family business. And we've got Domino's Pizza. Would you be interested to drive? Well, what he didn't realize is Ken had lost Benetton because Benetton wanted to be in a turbocharged car. Because the, the turbo era was starting. And yeah. I had tried, and I had tried to get, he and and Tolman to do the Brian Hart engine and split the cost because we'd have a turbocharged car. Right. And right. Um, anyway, it didn't happen. And Ken said, "Look, I might have to, you know, take another driver, or somebody, because of money and so forth and whatever." And I said, "Well, when are you going to tell me make the decision?" Because typical contract, especially with a newbie going in, all the advantage was in the. Tyrrell's, he had all the options, not the driver. And uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, he said he wasn't going to be able to decide until February. 
and we kept going back. What if we do this? What if we do that? And we were talking, and we, I was staying up all nights trying to figure out what to do and so forth. And then I got this offer from Doug Shearson, and it was kind of like, you know, bird in the hand, two in the bush, you know, sort of yeah. thing. Because if Ken told me in February, uh, you know, we've decided we're not going to take you, we're, we're going to take somebody else or this, that, and the other, then I, there was no drive going to Yeah, you'd you know, be stuck. Yeah, come that way. So sadly, it was uh, one and done and, and got out. And then I won three races that year for Doug Shearson, beat Rick Mears in the Pocono 500 by a nose. Um, and I didn't have my contract sorted out for Doug for the next year because he'd only given me a one-year contract. And uh, that's when uh, I had a call from Penske. And, you know, yeah. so, but, Doug, but to be cool. fair to Penske, Roger called my mentor, Frank Faulkner, who he knew very well and said, does Danny have a contract with Doug? And he said, let me find out. And I said, no, I don't have anything signed. And so Roger was not going to jump in if I, he wasn't going to try to get me to break a contract or anything like that. So, right. Okay. Um, gotcha. but, uh, but you know, you win three races with a team. One was a short over, one was the Pocono 500 and one was the Cleveland street race. Yeah. You three team, three races. You kind of go, do I really want to leave, leave these guys? Yeah. And you came fourth overall that year, didn't you? I think it was it fourth yeah. in the championship. Yeah. But you, but, but it was Roger, and he had that thing called the Indianapolis 500. He had a, he's got a pretty good run. Going. It, yeah. yeah, he's got a pretty good run going. It at any what 18 wins, you know? Yeah, yeah, he's doing okay. Yeah. 18 and, now we and have counting. Him. So, and so now we you know, I, it's you know, you never know when you make the decisions what's the right or wrong. So anyway, no, sure. Um, just something in the comments, uh, guys. Um, um, uh, Brigitta, I don't know if that's right. Um, we've got like Brigitta Santos. She says, um, is this a two-parter? We listed it on the 23rd of May. Sorry, guys, that was a typo. This is just a one-off uh, deal. But it's recorded, so if you've missed it, come and find it. Anyway, we'll get back to the interview now. Um, so, um, yeah, 1985, moved to Penske. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big deal. Um, doesn't get probably much bigger um, with that. Um, came third on your debut with the yeah. team. Which is pretty cool. Um, then but, you do you know the, but do you know the story? I came third at Long Beach. Yeah. But I was, but I was leading out of the hairpin on the last lap. Yeah. And, and yeah. ran out of fuel. Yes. So it, I, I, I could have started with a, uh, I should have started, but it, 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 I mean, it's, it happens. Just stuff happens. Yeah. But it, but it just, um, uh, but that was, that's why the third. So it was a little, anyway, all good. Slightly annoying third, if there is such a thing. Um, yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to bring up the circumstances. I had a bit of research no, on YouTube, you. and I found it. I was like, oh, leave that. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate it, but anyway. Yeah, it's good. Um, so you won the next race in 85, which we're going to come back to, obviously, later. Uh, we all know about that one. Um, there was um, there was a run of like lower finishes towards the end of the year. It took you out of the, uh, the contention for the title, but... How was that first season in Penske? Was it was it as was it what you thought it was going to be when you went well, to Penske? I thought it was great, um, but I think we could have won a lot more races. We just had some of the weirdest uh, mechanical failures. While we were leading a race in contention, you know. was really good the team opted. that i was on pretty good form but we just kept having these weird dnfs was stuff breaking that was just like uh we've never had that break before you know yeah. so but but you know anytime you can win the indy 500 in a year um it's it's pretty cool and you know and it, and it it kind of cemented me with the team it cemented everything with miller beer um everything was going along i had a I had a longer term contract, it was, you know, so from that perspective, everything was good. But, you know, you, you, there's never a racer out there that doesn't talk about the ones that got away. You no, know? sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just like yeah. I said about Long Beach, you know, it wasn't like it was just third. It was like, but you know what? <laughs> you know, if only, if only, <laughs> yeah, I didn't run it out of school. so, so, um, you know, but anyway, that's, you know, yeah, it's all by the, 
And, you know, I, and just to, to jump in right there, I look back mm -hmm. on it, and there's races that I, that I, you know, could have won or should have won or this, that, and the other. But then somebody could also argue about, well, you know, when you spun and won, you could, you should have hit the wall too or been taken out. So, you yeah. know, I, when I look back on the career, there was a lot of hard times, but there was a lot of great times, a lot of good times. Yeah. And, in the whole scheme of things, I can't complain. No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the uh, mentioned the spin and win. We're going to come back to that very, very, very shortly. Um, again, you've probably spoken about it a million times. We're going to make it a million and one. Um, but um, obviously, folk over here in the UK, they seem to think there's only one IndyCar race a year, um, which is the 500. And um, as I alluded to before, I've actually this is quite sad. I've actually got this little picture here. One of my favorite racing cars ever. I don't know if you can that, see that was one. a that was a Nigel um, Bennett designed one of the best cars ever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, I mean, I was what seven when I first saw the Indy 500 over here in '88. It was the first one I saw, and I saw um, I saw that car. Um, was it Rick Mears Rick, and, Rick Mears and, and Al Senior in the in the Penzoil cars, and Ari Leyendijk in the black car. And I thought, yeah. right, these four guys, I like, I'm going to follow these because when you're seven, it's the color of the car that you like, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so that's where that kind of started. And I just want to talk about um, about '88. Uh, the I see, years. based on your T-shirt, that you're still a a Pennzoil kind of guy. Yeah, um, this is the only sort of uh, yellow T-shirt I've got. I I've yeah. always liked the Pennzoil thing. I've actually got a road sign just on my wall over there with the little Pennzoil thing because I love it. This is actually a Copasuka t-shirt, but okay. Emerson, but um, it's yellow, it counts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 88 was the first one I saw, uh, absolutely brilliant car. Um, always thought that's what a single seater car should look like. Um, what was it like to drive that year? Was it, was it set well, up the, car, the car was fantastic. In fact, when we talk about ones that got away, that was the race, that was probably one of the three best cars and setups that I ever had in my career. And that car was was fast for all of us, unfortunately, with a with a substantial dominated kind of lead it, during that event. Uh, the front wing mount, there's an adjuster. You see these guys now they adjust them on the outside of the wings, but they used to do it in the nose. There was two holes down there, and the guy going with a you know just a speed brace and and, and adjust it that much a half turn or whatever, up or down or whatever. And that mount inside broke, and we saw that they were breaking. And on Al Senior's car, they his crew chip jammed a punch down in there and put some duct tape on it. Mine tried to do it with the tape, and right. the wing just at some stage just sat down. But remember something at Indy, and this goes back to the spin, everything. There's you're carrying almost no downforce in these cars. Yeah. Okay, there's very little downforce. There's Tiny wings. Right, and there's not very much banking in the whole scheme. It's not like, you know, being at Daytona or Talladega where you're up yeah. at 34, 38 degrees. It's like 11 uh, degrees, isn't it? Or yeah, and it's, it's very minimal. And so when you lose, you know, the wing wouldn't have had to, I'm just, I'm going to turn my face. You know, the wing, if it had a, if it had a gurney on it that was that big, which you can barely see, yeah. all that thing has to do is sit down by a quarter of an inch, half an inch, and you've lost the front downforce. Right, because it's... And, yeah. and that was one of the first times with an in-car camera, because Don Omar, that was produce, you know, producing the race, he said, you know, he called me, he said, you just won me an Emmy. I mean, that night, yeah. which I wasn't wrong. But you could it's see... You're right, you're right, the camera. Yeah, but you could yeah. see my hands. I'm in the wheel, in this corner like this, and my wheel just go like that but just that's it just right in the wall yeah. and uh and you know it's uh and i think jackie stewart called it he was doing one of the broadcasts and called it he said oh something's happened on the front wing you know he, he's lost the downforce but it just you know it's not like uh you know you're carrying a max a, a massive amount of downforce and you lose a quarter of an inch you know you know i mean these things are very sensitive you know, yeah. and, and uh, you know, that's why, believe it or not, on the scoring tower and down the back straightaway on the gant, going in turn three on the grandstand, there's a there's a wind sock up there right. on the, because the yeah. wind can shift and it'll change what your car does in certain corners. Because if it all of a sudden is pushing on the nose 
or pushing over your shoulder, it could it could either be it could pin the car more or give you more understeer. Sure. So yeah, yeah. believe it or not, I mean you almost are always checking out the wind socks. I was just going to say when 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 you go past, do you obviously you're going at like a thousand miles an hour, you know? Yeah. But do you, did you just glance up at it and just see what it was doing, so you knew what you were doing? No, I didn't. I mean, it was a fairly still day, but it just I'm just saying if it's a windy day or it's gusty, and you can you you pay attention to it a lot. You know, no, I'm so. sure. I think it's certainly over here, you know, everyone says, oh, it's just going around in circles, which is just ridiculous. Um, but there's things like that, you know, with the push and the wind and the gu and, and the gusting. And, you know, our, um, when we spoke to Ari Leyendijk about it, he actually said, yeah, that's the thing that a lot of European fans don't understand. If you've not been to Indy, which I haven't, but I will be soon, you don't realise that it does gust through there and it just it just takes one of those and it can pin you in the wall. Yeah, and it's and there's certain places where there's a gap in the grandstands, and that's why one is a lot more because the grandstands are so big there. It's a lot more mm -hmm. blocked if the wind is coming from the west, which is on the back side of the grandstands, which yeah, which which mostly the weather does come from the west. Right. But then it can if it blows over the grandstand when you go out of two, it can blow the nose up toward the wall. And then, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, uh, and you're more exposed in three to the wind elements. And anyway, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just an added element. And actually, where was, uh, was it Barcelona in Formula One last week? They were talking about the wind. Or yes. Was it, or was it in Port Mayo? Anyway, I think it was, in Mouse, it was up and down. In the yeah. Hill. But yeah. they said the wind is a factor. Yeah, you know, and uh, but now you do that at and not that they're going slow. I don't mean it that way, but you do it on a big, much more flat, open thing where you're carrying. I mean, they've got Formula One's got elements on on one side of one wing that are carrying more downforce than than a to IndyCar total on a, on at Indianapolis. You know, so yeah, yeah. So, wow. Anyway, so Amazing. remember, I think it used to be. I don't know if this is true, so please. All you guys that are out there fact checking this, but I think that if you're going down the straightaway at Barcelona in top, you know, obviously you're in top gear, maximum speed, and you just take your foot off of the throttle, the car will pull like three or four negative G's just from from the deceleration of not having the power on because of the downforce and ground effects and all the stuff, the tunnels, everything that everything goes just it's that's it's that much you know so, wow that's crazy some, some fact check or get that right and report back yeah oh, put it in the comments guys <laughs> it is. But, there, <laughs> but there's something along those lines that it's a pretty yeah. substantial amount just taking your foot off the throttle yeah. so anyway that's crazy um just what i mean i i asked the same question to ira line like when i spoke to him uh back in I think it was October kind of time. Um, this might be a daft question, but obviously when you know that that that, that wall was coming at you, what goes through your mind? Because he just, well, he just said, shit, <laughs> basically. Well, um, and it, he's, what, that's you know it's gonna hurt. <laughs> well, you, you do and you don't. I mean, I guess it just depends on the angle. I mean, I don't think anybody's ever thinking that when they're, even if you're spinning a Formula Ford off at Snetterton or Silverstone, I'm not so sure you're always thinking about, oh, this is going to hurt. Mm -hmm. you, it's a little bit more shit. What you know, <laughs> what happened or whatever, you know, because it happened so it happened so fast that that uh, even though it seems slow mo when you're going up, going oh, boy, you know, but you're just like, what happened? You know, what what. What, you know, and obviously, you know, you try to think about the stuff. If you're about to hit the wall, take your hands off the steering wheel, that that sort of stuff. But you know, so it doesn't snap in your in your uh, yeah. in your hands or whatever. But um, you know, it was the same thing when I when I got, which we're going to talk about when I spun in in the thing. I was so mad that I just got in the lead of the Indy 500. And now I'm spinning. I'm going to hit the wall. I never thought twice about hitting the wall in terms of I'm going to get hurt. I never, never even, it was just like, damn, I'm just getting, you know, lead of the Indianapolis 500. Now you're going to, you know, spin it. You're going to, you know, it's, it's, you know, it was that. It was not, there was not that, oh, this could hurt. It was just, you know, type. Yeah. 
So, yeah, wow. because you, you remember that you're, um, I had one of the things, a CV joint broke nine laps into the race one time. Uh, and I can still feel that one. I mean, I didn't get hurt, but just the, the impact at, at uh, Indy. Um, but you're more like, whoa, what just happened? What, How did I get here? You know, yeah. And then bang, and then bang. So you didn't, you, well, you're thinking, what, what was that? Did somebody hit me? Did I, you know, what, I mean, yeah. you know, so you don't, cert, certainly that's my thought process. Uh, you know, yeah. and if it is, I don't think about, um, you know, the other. Yeah, like getting hurt or anything. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what, what Ari said as well. So that's, uh, yeah, it's just the annoyance of what's happened, I guess. Um, but the rest of 88 went pretty well. Um, you know, yeah. you uh, yeah. won the championship. Um, that must have been very cool because you won with a race to spare, didn't you? I think it was. Yes, I closed it, it out. I closed it out at, at Laguna. Um, Laguna, and we still had Miami to, to go, which is, yeah. let me tell you something, that's a really nice feeling. Because you you know you don't have to you don't not loop and sleep over oh my gosh what if this goes wrong what if that goes wrong this that or the other I've got to do this you know it it uh, it it takes a lot of heat off trust me yeah yeah it must have been uh, yeah a nice way to you know to wind down the season knowing that you've done it and yeah it must have been pretty cool um, yeah must admit I mean I can remember, I, you know I was very young at the time and obviously over here in the UK in 1988 we had four channels we had four TV channels. We had BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, and Channel Four, and the only thing we saw was the Indy Five Hundred. And I was, and I remember saying to my dad, "Oh, do you know who won this race? Who won that race?" Because I started to, you know, oh. and but, there, but there, there was no coverage of it until um, it got a tiny mention in like the newspaper. And my dad showed me that you'd won the title, and I was like, I was really happy because obviously you were, as I said, you were one of the four guys that I'd latched onto for the Five Hundred. So uh, yeah, little seven-year-old me was pretty pleased. <laughs> so that was great. <laughs> Well, I was pleased too. Celebration went on for a couple of days. Trust me. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, no. uh, you were missed. You should have been there, even at. Six. Oh, I wish I wish I had been. Yeah. One day, one day. Well, I, I was actually planning to be at the 500 um, in two weeks' time, but obviously, because the world the way it's been, I've not been able to make it. But I'm going there next year, definitely. I'm hell or high water. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be there. Well, if you've ne if you've never done it, and this is for even for your listeners or and viewers out there, if you've never done it, um, it's a special event. It's like Le Mans. Le Mans is another really special event, and yeah. uh, and if you're not going to do it, it's one of those ones that you really ought to uh, try to go to because the it's uh, on the list. It, it's it's special. The grandeur is special. It, it's and I'm not knocking any other race and saying it's better. Please, it's not. I'm not trying to say it's better than anything else. Not sure. But if you've never been there, um, and the TV does not do justice to the speed, and uh, it's just uh, you, you know, get there if you can and spend the week there and and uh, enjoy it. Yeah, it's, that's the plan. That's the plan. We're 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 planning on going Thursday to Wednesday. The whole thing. Yeah. In and, out of Chicago, uh, in, in and out of Chicago and via Indianapolis. So fingers crossed we can do it. Um, well, they're going to open it up for, they're going to open it up for, um, I think it's 40% this year. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and I'm, I'm trying, I'm planning to go, but there's a couple things and I, the, the game plan is still to go up there because uh, I haven't been for since the hundredth. So I want to go. Oh, right. Back. Okay. That was, yeah. It's 105th this year, 105th, isn't it? 105th, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so Someone's yeah. just commented, uh, Mark Nichols, you said, along with the Daytona 500 and the Le Mans 24. Weirdly, those are the three races on my motorsport bucket list. So, um, yeah. yeah. I would agree. I mean, Daytona's, uh, Daytona's unbelievable. I wasn't trying to cut anybody out. I just meant that the uh, mm. Indies is, is something special. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait. Look, I'm smiling already. I've <laughs> got 54 weeks to wait, but... Never mind. Um, right. Well, we have to come back to 85. Um, okay. this is, um, again, this is probably about the five millionth time you've spoken about it. Um, you qualified uh, seventh. Um, if that says me correctly. Eight, 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 eight. Sorry. Qualified eighth. Um, middle of row three. Did you have any preference starting from middle or the left or the right of well, the row it really yeah uh... well you don't have any choice but it's just no i mean you're you feel like you're a little 
Well, let's put it this way. If I'm going into turn one on the opening lap, I'd re- if I can't be on the inside, I'd rather be in the middle than the outside. Sure. And so, you know, because it's even though the, you know, the track's not mega wide, um, it's not narrow. But when you got 33 cars run down in there in the corner together, uh, it doesn't take a lot if somebody up front or, or just gets a little moving around. It doesn't take a lot to have something big go wrong. And yeah, I think yeah. the good news is, is most people are, are pretty respectful of the first lap because they know it doesn't do much good to get. Although I say that some of the last <laughs> starts I've seen have been pretty racy, but in the whole <laughs> scheme of things, it's it's uh, it, it's pretty respectful of let's get through the right the first corner and let the dust settle a little bit and and go yeah. racing. And just so, settle into something. Um, just a quick look on the stuff off track with the Indy 500 before we carry on. Um, does it feel different every year? I mean, yeah, we've seen some great footage of you. Um, I must admit, I was up in the small hours of this morning here, uh, just checking a few bits online, and I was watching 88 and 90 and a few others. Um, and in, do you prepare differently? Because you always seem to just be sitting in the garage, you know, shades on, just just chilling out and just being cool. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know about, um, you know, you're pro- did, that's where it came across anyway. Yeah, but that's the, everybody's got their own thing, and just you know, I. I, I I get a little glassed over and just sit there and think about what we're going to do. And, and obviously for any race or almost in any race, okay. Cause you've already practiced qualified um, ours in a situation. You've already had carburation day, et cetera. So you're, you're, um, you're um, how can I say this? You, you know what you have, um, you know, you're taking in consideration whether, you know, what's the forecast? Is it going to rain? Is it going to do this? Is it going to do that? So you're trying to evaluate what kind of race you're going to run um, and what kind of chances. Because sometimes you got a car that's just like a horse and you think, I, this, I, can, I can dominate this race or I can win this race. But most of the time, you're, you know, not most of the time, but a lot of times you're like, okay, what am I going to do? I've got a couple of issues with this car or something's not, you know, great. What are we going to do? Are we going to make changes during the race to try to get it better? It's hotter today. Is the track going to be stickier? It's this, it's that, you know, I mean, so you're running through all that thing. So you, even though you're, like you said, you're sitting there and you look pretty cool and you're shaking hands or talking to people, yeah, I get a little glassed over and, and beforehand and got to get down to business before too long. But no, uh, sure, sure. You know. And I think this is one of the things, though, for, if you think about it for most sports, motor racing is unique in that respect. Um, whether it's, you know, Formula One, you know, Le Mans, Daytona 500, as somebody pointed out, any of these things, any race, it doesn't even have to be the big ones, but before a race, sponsors are there, people are there, people have a pass to get in, people are coming up, want to say, hey, you're talking, trying to talk to a sponsor, to this person, everything. And then you just put your stuff, stuff on and go. but. You don't see that you know, yeah, before, sure. a, a, before a football match or anything like that, where everybody's right. hanging out with, with sponsors. You know, they're in there putting their kid on and they're in the locker room or whatever. Golf, tennis, everybody's kind of off yeah. doing their thing. But racing, you're, you're and there's I'm some restrictions, but you're, there's more people expo- you know, around you than you, than, than not. And so you have to find a way to just kind of, Hey, 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 da 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 da, da. but you're shut off and, still you're, keep and stay focused. Yeah. And, awesome. Um, awesome. No, anyway. No, cool. One of, the, one of the one cool. of the benefits and also one of the drawbacks of, of what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Just want to pick something up on the comments. Um, um, I have like Linda uh, Cotter. She's obviously a huge fan. She tuned in for the Mario interview, which was brilliant. And um, um, very sadly, um, she lost her son. Um, uh, Blake, um, I don't know how long ago, excuse me, Linda, I'm not going to go into it, but um, she just said that um, her son Blake was your biggest fan when he was only four for your spin and win, um, same age as me, um, and he's got your autograph on his driving suit, had a cardboard four-foot cutout of your Miller car hanging from the ceiling over his race car bed and had a soapbox racer of your Miller car. That's pretty um, cool. That's very cool. Thank that's you, Linda, cool. for sharing that. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, that's lovely. That's, that's lovely. special. I'm sorry about the loss. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, thank you for the support, Linda, for the page. Thank you. 
Um, so 85, you know, we were having a, you know, we were having a sort of quick chat about it. Um, did you, obviously you qualified eighth, you obviously felt the car was sort of decent and you could go and have a good run there. Um, and you talk about cars that dominated the race. Um, you may not, you know, probably won't mind me saying it was dominated by Mario, wasn't it? I mean, he, right. well, yeah. he was very good. And there was a few incidents, but you made your way up through to, I think it was fourth and then into second with the fuel only stop and everything. Right. Um, from memory and from research and being a nerd, um, <laughs> I picked that up. Um, I was going to say you know more, you remember more about it than I do. But uh, no. the internet's a great thing; um, <laughs> you can find stuff out. Um, now, um, this is something I've wanted to ask you for a long, long time. Um, this radio message that apparently was misunderstood by you from the team about how many laps to go there was was that. Accurate, did that case? Yeah, uh, well, uh, well, remember, the radios weren't quite as good there. There was hmm. a lot of interference during that time. Um, everybody in those days were, was trying to work with helmets that were a little bit more aerodynamic and so forth. And because I was behind Mario, um, you know, and you know, you don't know how long you're into the race. We had had, I'm going to back up a little bit, the car hmm. was not particularly good early on. And I was losing ground, um, and I, I was, you know, not a lap down, but I was, I was a long way down. And Derek Walker, who was the team manager for Penske, but he was the guy on my radio, okay. And Derek um, made a call to stop out of step and make a change to the car because I was just losing too much ground, and I was going to get lapped if we didn't do something, do something. And so, you know, you make that and you're fighting your way back through the deal and you're picking up and you're, you're and now the car is good. And you get, well, how many laps to go? Because, you know, you're doing a 200 lap race. Is it, is it 50 laps to go? Is it 20? And I thought they said 20 or something along. And I go, my God, that's, I better pick it up because Mario's tough to pass at the best of times, yeah. much less late in the race. But remember, you're going down the straightaway and, you know, the car is buffeting. The, the scoring pylon has the number of laps on the top of the deal. But you're going down there, you're, the thing's buffeting around. You can't read the pit board very well. You know, you're doing 210, 50, 215 miles an hour, too, in the turbulence. So you're watching... Mario's doing this going down straight away. He's moving, you know, and you're trying to stay with him. So it's not like, you can't oh, see let, me take, let me take a look. Oh, yeah, yeah. How many laps <laughs> up on the top of the pit board? You know, you're just trying to kind of decide how many. And, you know, it wasn't real clear. And there's buffeting and, the, and so forth. Yeah. And so I thought I was closer to the end than I was. Right. But right. now, having said that, it wouldn't have made any difference. Because when I passed, when I got to Mario, I wouldn't have waited indefinitely anyway, even if I'd known there was, you know, 60 or 70 something laps left. I, I'm behind him. I don't want to be behind him. I want to get out and, and lead from the front and make my own way. And my car was good. So here's the situation. Everybody says, well, why pass him going into turn one? Well, my car was better. His car was very good. My car was very good at this time but I was a little better off a of three and four than I was off a of one and two. Right. And, and the reason you combine, or I do, the reason I combine one and two, because if you run pretty good off of one and you're close to him and you can stay with him off a of two, then you got a better shot down the back straight away into three. Sure. My car just seemed to like it better behind him in three and four than it did one and two. I could be just that little bit closer to get a better run down the down the straightaway, so right. he's moving around down there, and in, in something that's very important, the new when I say the new track, they changed it some years ago, quite a few years ago. They they took the warm up lane off of the off of the, I still had the warm up lane, so people when they'd go out of the pit in the pit, they'd drive around on the warm up lane. They didn't have the one that cuts off inside the track by whatever it is, 20 yards or something like that. Yeah. You know? So it rejoins so, it too, doesn't it? So it's pretty flat. The track's got a little bit of change there. And then I, I know this sounds silly, and this is just a lot of my fault, but 
because of the track being run, they paint those little white lines. They paint those every night during the month of May. And it used to be a month long deal because yes. they don't want the black lines and the spins and stuff to go across. Then you remember we were talking about stagger. Okay. Well, in the, in the old bias plied days, the stagger could alter how the car handled. So you used to run through all these sets of tires before the race to get one. And in the day, I don't, don't hold me exactly to it, but I think if you had a 28 thou stagger over 32 thou stagger, your car would push, but the 32, the car would rotate better. Okay. Wow. But it, but it, so, it's, so just to put that into perspective, that in the whole circumference of a tire is the difference between a matchbook cover. That's okay, so come back to what come back to what we were talking about earlier about how sensitive these cars are, okay, yeah. and how it doesn't take a lot to do that. So um, anyway, just when I came back up on the track, and and some guys used to we all ran a little bit more staggered springs because you wanted to be a little bit more uh, stable, stable, and keep the thing flatter so that the tires worked more evenly across the deal okay um and just when i came back up in front of him i passed mario come back up and when we turned in mario just turned down too he was not giving up the corner he just turned down that's why we, if you look at us we almost look like fighter going down there and then as i had the shorter distance i come up in front of him and the car just started to trip it just started to <laughs> and I tried to correct it and thinking, okay, if I just put a little in it, I could feel the front starting to bite, which would have mean it was going to bite and turn nose first into the wall. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't going to do a spin. I was going to hit really hard. Straight into the. So I just turned back down, still tried to hold it. Here we go. I spin, smoke. This is when I'm going like, Ari, oh shit, I just get in the lead of the Indianapolis 500. I jump on the brakes and trying to, you know, woe the car, natural instinct. The smoke clears and there's the turn two sweets in front of me. Of course, yeah, they got the sweets there, yeah. Yeah, so I just took my foot off the brake. Now, here, here's the problem. The engines, I've stalled the engine because I jumped on the brake. I never put the clutch down. I just jumped on the brake because what right. difference does the clutch make if you're going to slam the wall, okay? It's, and so I jump on the brake. Now, engine's dead. Take my foot off. Okay, so in those days, it was a five-speed gearbox. Three speed-up gears to get out of the pits, you know, to get up, to get going. And then we ran two top gears which is they were about usually two anywhere 200 250 rpm different so if you were racing a guy you might want to be in the lower gear just to for a little bit more rpm but if you were driving to save fuel and you were running by yourself you'd run the top top one to right. save them because 250 rpm is still going to burn a little bit less fuel okay so as we sit here to this day I do not know which gear that I took to jump start the engine because if I go too low, I wasn't going to put it in first gear. We don't have a speedo, so I don't know how fast I'm going. To, yeah. Know. So which gear do I take? I'm not going to take first or second, but I'm thinking third, fourth, definitely not fifth. Third, yeah. Fourth, you know, what? to this day, I don't even remember. But if you look at the tape, go back and look at the tape again. When I go into turn two, you'll see the car go shh. Again, that's when yeah. I jumped, and I almost lost it again. I almost, I thought, oh God, here really? we go again. And uh, wow. and I jump started, and I called Derek Walker on the radio, and I said, Derek, Derek, the yellow's for me. The yellow's for me. Everything's okay. No problem. No problem. And uh, he said that I was about normal, but it was about two octaves higher. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but it was just. But, but if they had not thrown the yellow, and this is something too, which we were talking about, because there was so little uh, downforce and a spin, and yes, I locked the brakes, I put the tires on. But if they had not, if they had taken the yellow away and I had to run 10 laps, 
it wouldn't have been very pleasant, but I was not going to have to stop if I had to. They weren't they weren't flat spotted like <laughs> like this yeah. kind of flat spot because it spun like just a top going down the road. And so um, anyway, it's you know, but at the pace that I just told you the story, right? That's the pace the process was going through my mind in the in the deal. And of course, it only took, what, a one second to do the whole one and a half, two seconds or something to do the whole thing. But that's the, for me, that was the process that was going through my mind. Obviously, I'm thinking a little faster than. But it just went. (laughs) But it just goes that way. And I think that's true for if you if you talk to almost any any racer, they'll they'll I'm sure they'll tell you the same thing when something's happening there. It's all going in. Slow mo is the wrong word, but because us, it's real time. But you're trying to—that's—that's that's the brilliant of, of race car drivers is they're trying to analyze that stuff in milliseconds. Yeah. As it happens, almost. Yeah. So anyway, and I'm not. Please, I'm not trying to say I'm different than anybody else or whatever. I'm saying we're all. I think we're all of the same ilk that we're we're trying to. Can I get through that gap? No, yeah. sorry, that was the wrong gap. You know, but you, yeah. you try to analyze. Yes, I can make it and you've got a millisecond to do it so yeah brilliant yeah. brilliant um so, just when it, when it happened and you realize you're facing the right way and you think right did you just think this could be my you know maybe someone's on my shoulder here did you think this this could just pan out because there afterwards and um just to um yeah saying there after no, was, no i'll show you let me jump let me jump in there i you know I thought I got you think about you got away with one. But later on, when I was coming back through to catch Mario, Howdy Holmes, who had replaced at Shearson, was doing the Indy 500, mm. and Tom Sneva. Yeah, Sneva had a crash. And I'm, going, and I'm going down the straightaway, and I'm, I'm catching the guys to lap them and close on Mario. And I thought, you know, Howdy late in the race sometimes gets a little tired and you know, uh, and I just going down because once you commit to the corner to one, three, two, you're you're not jumping on the brakes. You're not slowing the car down other than rolling out of the throttle. And they're going down, and I thought, so I rolled out a little bit to just to see what happens because they were going to go into the corner almost side by side. Sure enough, they touch. Howdy goes up and hits the outside wall. Sneva spins. And normally when they spin, particularly on an oval, even with a little banking at India, they go up to the wall or down to the inside, right? He went right down the line in turn one. And and I'm coming in there and I'm trying to woe the car without, I'm, you know, just, and I'm just getting right there. And right before I got there where I was about to hit him, he just slid up the track and was gone. And I thought, I thought, oh, that was so close. And of course, probably what Mario was thinking when I did the spin in front of in front of him, yeah. because now it's right there in front of you, and you don't have any, you don't have much to say in the whole situation. So whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Right. And uh, and then later, I was thinking, okay, things are going my way right now. But I never thought that it was, you know, there's still too much racing to go and. And I still hadn't passed my. I still hadn't caught Mario and passed him again either. So it's no, not like I mean, it's not like, you know, you know. I was already you were right there, was it? Yeah, no, no, no. But I, but my car was good. Um, uh, the car was really good. There is a question that I just. I'm just I'm sorry, I'm not popping up on everybody there. But should the captain consider putting? I was going to come. Yeah, there? yeah. And I, I, me personally, they did it a lot for safety because when guys were out there running and guys were warming up their cars, it, it, it gets pretty hairy when they're just going by. But they could keep the, the warm-up apron, I mean, the, reg, the one they have right now, and then use an apron, um, uh, use that apron back. And I think, believe it or not, I think it would benefit the IndyCar races, but I think it would benefit the NASCAR race even more. Because yeah. that would just give them a little bit more room to cut down because they got to wait so long to get the groove and it becomes a little bit of a one groove racetrack and nascar in particular are not great one groove uh cars yeah. um, and i think but it would help indy as well we've seen some remember the michael andretti rick mears 
when oh, they yeah. passed them around the outside. Well, if that oh, apron yeah. hadn't been there, that it just I don't know if that you know would have been doable. So, Not so sure. the answer is I'm a big believer in the apron. It saved yeah. my ass, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but the anyway, force of I, experience. I didn't mean to jump in, and I see all these coming up there. So I apologize to everybody else we haven't talked about. Yeah. No, we are going to. We're going to try and come back to some of these towards the end. We try and do that. Um, obviously, um, like towards the end, obviously, um, you, know, you you had a gap out in the lead, having passed Mario on around lap one forty, I think. Um, John Paul Junior crashed. Um, you know, um, um, God bless him. Um, and so you lost the gap there. And then Bill Whittington, who's recently passed yeah. as well, um, very sadly, um, he crashed, and you lost your gap again on the restart. You had some back markers in front of you. Were you nervous thinking no, I, actually, we're, I was, we're kind of getting to the sharp end here? No, I had I had the lead, but the back markers, one of them being Michael, so it wouldn't Michael Andre, so I'm not much of a back marker, and somebody else was between me and Mario, but I was the I was the lead car. And I'm thinking, oh, and I kept trying to get him to hurry up, tell the pace car to hurry up, because I wanted to finish under a yellow, who wouldn't? And because I'm looking back there seeing Mario and I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to be exciting. And they restarted with four laps to go. And yeah. If I had had duct tape in the car, I would have put it over the mirrors. Okay. I didn't want to know just, who was back there. I just thought, okay, I got I restarted early. I timed it pretty good. Got a big run off of four, got a gap. And I think, and again, somebody's going to fact check. I think my fastest lap of the race was the second to last lap of the race. All wow. I was worried about was, because this is Mario Andretti, okay? I mean, the legend, okay? Yeah. This guy's won in everything, he's great, and he wanted a second Indianapolis 500 win like like nobody else, yeah. okay? And I'm just thinking, okay, hit your marks, be smooth, stay on the power, run this thing as fast as you can, no mistakes, no mistake, you know, just you're trying to talk yourself. But what you really do, and that comes back to that thing, is now the blinders get even like this. Yeah. Know? Think there, think there, think there. Don't don't be looking and don't take a glance in your mirror and you know because then it might force you to make a mistake just focus on on the front yeah look at what you're doing uh, yeah. anyway. i mean i saw uh, um obviously during lockdown i was at home a lot i used to just watch like the mini 500 reruns and i watched the 1998 one when eddie cheever won and he was yeah. way out in front and he just said all, and he said the same thing all i could think about was that yeah and he, and, and he said he was just going faster and faster and his team was saying, no, no, you're fine. Stop it. He's off. He's like, no, I'm winning this no. thing. And he just. Well, he, I, I think you're right. I think when you start becoming, if you start becoming too cautious and the speed's what's gotten you there, um, that's when you can make a mistake. Cause I think yeah. you mentally relax. Yeah. And there's so much stuff we're talking about wind. It can be paper on the stuff blowing around all you know you got 400,000 people in the stands there's yeah. all kinds of crap blowing around all over the place at the end of the race and there's all the rubber marbles down and and <clears throat> all the stuff so you've got to really really focus on this on, on what's going on and I think if you back off on the pace um, and become too conservative you you tend to make a mistake and, yeah, sure. and I, I would agree, I agree with him 100% particularly when you're out there leading. And the other thing, too, is that history, and again, somebody can fact check this, but I, I, there's an awful lot of people been leading that race with 20 laps to go that never won it. You know, yeah. just stuff yeah. happens in the last 20 laps. Yeah. And, you know, you can easily get caught up in a, you can easily get caught up in somebody else's accident. It's happened to me before where you're not even with them. You know, yeah. you, you know they have an accident. And, all and you come you're, around and... Yeah, and you're, you're you don't have, and at the speed you're going in those corners, you don't have a lot of chance to move left to right or this that. Yeah, you you move, and that's what can tend to make your car spin. So anyway. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, quick one, just on it. Obviously, people like me were never going to experience this. What is it like to cross the yard of bricks first? And you think I've done it? It's got to be the best feeling, isn't it? It's got to be the coolest it's feeling. It is, there's nothing like it, but I think um, for me anyway, um, it took me a long time to have it all really sink in. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, you cross it and you're going, damn, you know, I won the Indy 500, but then there are, somebody's on the radio and the crowd's doing this and you're trying to wait and, you know, which is a super feeling. But, you know, we had been there for a month too. So you got this build up and it's yeah. just, and it's just, if you don't win it, it's pretty anticlimactic anyway. But what happens then after all that build up and all the demands on your time, all the practice, everything, the bubble kind of burst. It's done. And, yeah. and, and then you come in in the old days, they don't have the, they didn't have the thing where you pull on the winter circle and it drives up. You had to drive up these ramps. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, you didn't drive up, they push you up, but you had to drive yeah. to make sure. And it was two narrow ramps, ramps, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm thinking, God, what if I screw that up and really miss it or drive it off the edge or something like that? You know, you're thinking stupid things. And <laughs> then you get up and then you're, you're, you're kind of swept off of your feet. You know, you're, you're being pulled here and this interview there and this one and da, 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 da and everything's going this way and then you know then the the interviews and the talk shows the next day and then the appearance and this i mean by the way this is all really cool stuff i'm not i'm oh. not this is not a complaint but but you're swept up and i remember about gosh it was probably three weeks later i'm in michigan we're testing it at MIS, and I'm, I've been on this whirlwind plus races, Milwaukee, you know, Portland, all, and and uh, I'm I'm getting ready to go, and I'm taking a shower, and I'm sitting there going, "Damn, you won the Indianapolis 500." You know, I mean, it just it took that long for me for it to real, I mean, to really sink in. Yeah. Really sing, yeah. I guess because you had so much going on, it was the first time you had some time with just yourself, and you just yeah. thought, "Wow, I did." Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you're being pulled here and go this, or you're doing this appearance, you're doing that show, you're doing, you know, talk show, you know, type stuff, and then and it's the first time you get, and then when you finally get to the track, you're kind of now focused, trying to focus on the race car and what you're doing, and yeah. and it's just kind of like, oh wow, wow, you know. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. I did it. Wow, that's cool. Just one last thing on 85. Um, um, there was like Linda uh, Cotter again, she commented, um, and it led on to something I was going to say. Um, uh, Linda said, what did Mario say after the race? And that leads on to, is it true that he didn't speak to you for a year? <laughs> well, he, uh, no, he didn't. I mean, he was, uh, he was not, don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't think Mar Mario was bitter or anything. He just thought, how'd that one get away? And yeah. How did that guy not hit the wall? And I, she was right about some stuff. We'd come up and be in a group and, and run and he'd say hey to everybody, but he'd really kind of not talk to me for about, about a year. But I mean, you know, but you know what? As I said before, Mario is absolutely brilliant. I mean, he's one of the guys that I kind of, wanted to be like in a lot of ways, um, you know, one in everything, sports cars, stock cars, you know, Indy cars, Formula One. I mean, you know, the guy's just, you know, such a stud and did so much. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, he was he was pissed off. He it was the one that got away. I mean, you know, Mario Michael Andretti have led so many laps around that place in between yeah, those two Michael, Michael's led more than anyone else without winning, think, isn't he? Yeah, I think so. And it just it's just staggering because yeah. they certainly had the speed and the capabilities and yeah. and talent to do it. I mean Mario did it, but but uh, you know, for Mario to not really be in the board with three or four wins is is pretty surprising as yeah, it, yeah. and for some yeah. of the teams. I think I think it's you know, he probably feels that way as well. But uh well, but, when, but um, he and I are, he and I have always been good and, yeah. and uh, you know, super guy. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when he was kind enough to join us on here, which um, still blows my mind, I still can't believe Mario. I spoke with him, Mario. And even on the, even on like the intro thing that I, that I do, I actually said, you know, he's an absolute legend. It's a privilege to have him on. And if he races in it, Chances are he's won in it. I mean, he's that, yeah, he's that good. And he said he didn't believe in this Andretti curse thing that goes on. Um, you know, there's talk about the Indy, you know, the Andretti curse at the 500 and things like that. And um, and he said, oh, I don't believe in it, you know, because as you say, it happens to everyone. 
But I, in the back of my mind, I think, oh, there must be something just uh, just niggling at the back of your brain about it. Because <laughs> they had well, to... Mar Mario might not feel that way because he won it. Michael might have a different opinion on that. A good, yeah, true. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, but they're, look, you know, they're legends. They're, they're both big names. Uh, Michael's doing a super job now with the team and everything. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's, he's won it now, but he's won it as a team owner. You know, yeah. which is which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, he's I, got I one he with, um, yeah, with Bobby yeah. Rahal, which is another cool thing, isn't it? He's, yeah. he's uh, an yeah. owner. And uh, so that you know, from that perspective, I think it's uh, uh, you know. Anyway, I think it's pretty cool. And yeah. I see one here. Shout out Mike Hunt on his birthday. Yeah. Uh, didn't know it was Mike Hunt's birthday, but there you go. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, Happy birthday, Mike Hunt. Uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, anyway, the um, but you know Mario is just—I mean, he's a great guy, and we've had some super talks. And he's always a guy if you ever want advice on on something that I can call him and go to. And you know, he's yeah. a very cool guy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, lovely guy. Um, just moving on, um, moving on to the following year. Uh, again, this has probably come up a lot of times. One of the things that maybe came off the back of the Indy 500 win. Sorry to mention this, but so many people have mentioned it. Um, Miami Vice. You were in Miami yeah. Vice. Yeah. Um, playing, was it Danny Tepper, wasn't it? The Danny guy, Tepper, racing yeah. car driver um, accused of murdering Murder. Florence, oh. Italy. The <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you've done your, I mean. Yeah. yeah. That's, true. Um, that's very cool. How did Michael, that come Michael, about? Well, Michael Mann, who's the famous movie tv producer that did miami vice but he did stuff like the movie heat uh with de niro and pacino he did uh uh what was the one um uh, anyway he's done westerns he's done i mean he's an amazing yeah. guy but michael's a car guy he right he was like yeah. and he actually was trying to do for a long time the movie on a day in the life of, enzo, of ferrari enzo ferrari and uh, he's a very clever producer, and he did the but so had diverse. He did the last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day Lewis. I mean, right. that, you know, the guy's brilliant. But he's a car guy. He he not he's not a big Ferrari guy. He'll talk to you about his Chevy Nova with this engine that he did this in. You know, kind of a not a hot rod, but a muscle car guy. Yeah. And Michael said, "Hey, we've had a bunch of guest stars on here from different walks, like Phil Collins." um you know to different places glenn fry and he said we'd like to have you on the show it's like and miami vice at that time was like the number one rated show and yeah. i knew don johnson because we both lived in aspen at the time and uh so i knew don and and it was like hey come on down we'll make it easy on you and uh you know it was pretty cool to do it i mean you know it's it's uh you know as my sister said don't give up your day job <laughs> but, uh, you know, but you know, it was fun. It was a you know, it was a big learning. It was a big learning experience, and and it's surprising how many people I meet that go, Indy 500, Miami Vice, Indy 500, Miami Vice. You know, so you know, That's I guess it's a little bit like Elio Castroneves, Dancing with the Stars. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, I forgot he did done that. Yeah, no, he won it. I mean, yeah, he, he yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it's yeah. just you know. An opportunity comes. It's you know. I'm glad I did it, um, but I didn't get a. I wasn't getting a lot of people calling me after that to start. No, you didn't get a call back. Yeah, but <laughs> no, anyway, just, going back to, just going back to Helio Castroneves, he's probably quite good in his feet after climbing up all the fences, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. Good <laughs> point. Spider Man. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, just before you move on a little bit, um, uh, a guy called Simon Hill has uh, sent a message in. Now his son is actually um, uh, leading the British Touring Car Championship uh over here jake hill um this is probably his era um hi simon again um he says uh, he was at brands in 1983 brands hatch when you got yeah. close to winning the race of champions um did racing with eldon in formula ford 1600 amongst others make brands hatch your favorite now i know simon lives near brands hatch so he, he likes to hear what drivers think about brands so is well, it, let, uh, me you, is let me tell you let me tell you simon i lived believe it or not across the street in a boarding house that was red webs boarding house if you came out the front gate and turned left and went down it was the first house on the right back in the day 
And here's some names that you all might have. Tom Price lived in the house. Yeah, the late Tom Price. Yeah, Tony Tremor. All of us lived at that house, and it was a boarding house. Now, don't laugh, but it was eight quid a week for a room and board. (laughs) Wow. And Red was the, I mean, it was the, I had more fun at that house because all it was was talking about racing, and you were all with racing people, and Red was fabulous, and, uh, and Eldon had their shop further down the road, uh, going, what would that have been, south, I guess, okay. uh, further down the road. And so it was a natural place for me to live. And when I came over there, as we said before, with a good doctor, I mean, I wasn't, we weren't rolling in money, so I wasn't going to be, you know, staying someplace. And that was a, and, and you know, it engaged every day. And back, back in the day, every Wednesday, we got to test at Brands Hatch on the club circuit, not on the Grand Prix circuit, but yeah, sure. I think Brands Hatch is a fantastic, a fantastic deal. And Simon, yeah. I want to point, I want to do a little plug today. A close friend of mine's son, Max Esterton, won today at Silverstone in the wet in the form of Ford. And hey. in, the, in the early race, he was second to the last lap and ended up finishing third. And he's coming over to, he's coming back over. I mean, he's staying over there to do his apprenticeship in a Formula Ford. And he's had a couple, he's had, I think the slowest finish he's had is a fourth. And, wow. and, and so he's doing well, but he had his first win today at Silverstone. So a big uh, plug for Max. Look, yeah, keep, a, big, look keep a look out for his name. He's yeah, big well done to him. We'll yeah. definitely, keep, a, we'll definitely yeah. keep an eye open. So um, anyway, but yeah, Formula Ford, that, it was a big deal for me. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. awesome. Just seeing something come up. Oh, this is completely off track. Um, got, um, uh, we've got like Brigitte Santos. She's uh, building a model by the looks of it. Says, um, Autosport didn't, uh, the Autosport magazine didn't run color until 1975 when you were in the modus. What yeah. color was the March 733743 vegan tune? I think they're making a model and they want to know what color it was. <laughs> red. It was a red car. It was red. And it didn't have uh, anything trick about it, but that was all. Um, all I, I bought it that way, so it wasn't going to get painted. I didn't have the money to do any of that stuff right. anyway. So yeah, yeah. yeah. there you go. Paint it red. <laughs> um, oh, there you go. Stuart Cole living at Reds too. Thanks, Danny. We'll look out for Max at Brands. There yeah. you go. There we go. That's it. Tom and everything. You know I just want to. I just want to make a point here. Okay. This is what's so cool for me about British racing and why I miss all the time. Everybody over there is kind of engaged. You know, you can talk about uh, Red Webb's house. Look at this thing comes up about, about, uh, you know, thanks and Max and all that and and Simon and everybody like that. That's what the, it's such a community. The fans, everybody there is so engaged. The marshals, everything. It's, uh, it's, it's from a, Young racer, this is the place you want to be. Yeah, it, it's place. a very. I mean, England. Yeah, um, it's a very cool community to be in. Sort of, just slightly on my part, I just talk about it. But um, yeah, it's very cool. And while we're on plugging, I'm just going to plug Simon's son, Jake. Uh, Jake Hill. Uh, if you don't watch the British Touring Car Championship, guys, tuning in, check it out. Jake's finished third in the first three races, and he's leading it. And um, we had a chat with him about two weeks ago, and he's awesome. So check out Jake Hill. Um, Right, where are we? Okay, moving on um, a bit from there. Um, I just want to have a quick chat, quickly about the crash in '89 at the 500, where you raced with a broken arm, wasn't it? Did you? Yeah. Um, right there. Play, oh, play there's the seven screws right down there. Yeah, there's it. Yeah. And you raced with it. Did you think, um, had the car not failed, do you think you could have won that one? Did you think? No, no, I wasn't. I was. I wasn't. Remember something that it, I, it uh, had a bodywork failure going into three in practice, and uh, Nigel Bennett had said, "You know, we got this little thing. I got to fix that tonight." And unfortunately, it, it failed and and uh, broke my arm. And and uh, sc- but I wasn't going to be uh, quick enough to sure. to win it. I mean, a clutch win. But I was the. But I qualified six days later. I made a brace. It went here up my arm so that my it bypassed my forearm and all the load went into my bicep. Right. And I put a little thing on the steering wheel so I could jam the 
the carbon fiber piece into the and push. The, and here's a question for everybody out there. Okay, if you're driving a race car in particular, are you a pusher or a puller Ooh, on deep. the steering wheel? Oh, yeah. You push with a hand or do you dominate and pull with a hand? There you go. Answers in the comments, guys. That's a great okay, one. So that's a, because I never even thought about it until I had a broken arm and then I realized I've more pushed from, right. from my side. But some guys, like, anyway. Um, left. And but I, I I was the fastest qualified six days later, but that was just a qualifying where you you know you do your warm up lap, do your four laps, and and that's one thing. But to hold on for two hundred laps and and uh, I did two more races. I did there and then Milwaukee the next weekend. And see, there's a pull. Somebody just yeah. came up, Thomas Parker, pull. Um, and uh, and something broke there and something broke at Milwaukee. And then I was in second, Dyson with Michael Andretti at Detroit, and they had x-rayed my arm before it, and it was starting to separate. It was pulling away from the plate and the screws, and it got hurting so bad. Now, it, Detroit, that was the downtown race. That was not by a while, yeah. and it was pulling it apart. And in fact, I had to stop, and then I had to, to lay out for two months, and Jeff Brabham stepped in. Yeah, uh, you, we mentioned Jeff earlier, and Jeff stood stood in for me at uh, at the at the time. But racers are pretty competitive. We don't want somebody else stepping into our seat and maybe <laughs> showing us up. You know what I'm saying? So we're all yeah, sure. we're all too competitive. So anyway, yeah, no, fair um, enough. Uh, but, um, again, just jumping on. Um, I just want to have a very quick chat about this. Um, 1992, 500. Um, I remember it. This was the first one I really, really remember. It was absolute carnage, wasn't it? Um, the whole month. It was, I mean, I, again, I got a little, um, I mean, you, you finished fifth, which is uh, very cool with what happened in that month. But obviously we lost, um, you know, we lost like Jovi Marcelo, very sadly lost um, before the race. Um, but there was crashes for for, um, for Britain, but back to Scott Brayton again, who we've lost. Since um, got Buddy Lazier, um, Paul Tracy, Rick Mears had a huge crash. Uh, Nelson PK broke his feet. Um, Roberto Guerrero stuck it in the wall on the on the warm up lap. Uh, Tom Sneaver, Philip Gash, Dan Fox, uh, Jim Crawford, Rick again, Emerson, Mario, Jimmy Vassa, Brian Bono. Everyone had crashed that year. It was just one of those years where it just, I mean, now I asked Mario about this because everyone was saying, was it the cold track? Uh, and things like that and mario just said well maybe but you've still got to drive the car and if you put it in the wall then it's your fault type thing um what are your thoughts on what happened in 92 because it was just madness wasn't it well, well there was some temperature issues but mario's right i mean okay if you don't have as much grip that you're you, if you're the driver it's still your job to figure out how much grip you've got and not yeah. overdo it but i think there's you know the problem with that Indy is, as always, there's so much at stake and you, you know, people are pushing it a little bit hard, um, but it was just one of those weekends or one of those races that people just couldn't, I mean, it, you know, couldn't get it together to start the race. And it was just like, Hey, yeah. this is one where you got to just be careful. And if you lose a pace on a restart, cause some guy got a little bit more heat in his tires or he got it away with it a little bit better. You know, you couldn't go crazy overdoing it. You had to, you know, you're you're always trying to finish. So yeah, that was a. Yeah, I guess in times like that, you know, to finish first, you have to finish, isn't it? You know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And what a finish it was that year. Um, was yeah. The closest ever, wasn't it? So. Yeah. No, it was unbelievable. You know, it was. Uh, but it just sometimes those things happen. It just happens. Yeah. Some races are, you know, you go and everybody finishes, and then you go to one race. And, like you said, there's a lot of carnage. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, again, I mean, yeah, we can talk about the next few years, but we've, we've been on for a while and I don't want to take up too much of people's time. Um, but um, um, if we may just move forward to, um, was it 90, was it 93, your final year? Um, I think it was 93, I can't remember. No, I, got, I actually got hurt um, in 95. It was 95 sorry yeah um but i but i i was out i was out one year and and then got anyway but 95 was when i got hurt at uh, michigan yeah and, um uh, obviously you you uh, yeah of course because you've been away in 94 uh out of it right. 
apart from the 500. Um, were you thinking about um, uh, about calling it a day at the end of that year? Uh, yeah, or... you always, yeah, you always think about it in terms of, um, you know, am I good enough? Uh, do I still have what it takes? Um, you know, am I am I in the right team to give me what I need to 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 you know be a challenge? I wasn't going to probably get a call from uh, Roger Pinsky again. You know, just yeah. with his age. Um, you know, so you're always questioning that. Then there's opportunities that are coming up, and you know, I, ABC had approached me a couple of times, and you know, you're you're kind of going along those lines, but. Um, the crash did it, and then basically there was some other issues, and I just I, I still had two years left on a contract with with uh, Bruce McCall, and he was a total gentleman. And I just said, "Hey, Bruce, I think the time is right." ABC had come into my hospital um, and said, "Hey, we've got a seat for you at the you know at the commentator table. Uh, we'd like you to join." And and uh, you know so. That always helps when you have an avenue to go someplace else. Sure. Sure. Um, it, it always gives you that, okay, now let's weigh it up a little bit different other than, hey, if I just stop right now, I'm just out. I mean, that's just it. There's no, you know, so, and I was of the right age that, uh, you know, I was getting a little long in the tooth anyway. I mean, you know, the next year I would have been 46 years old. So it was kind of like, you know, to really be hustling a Indy car around, you know, a lot of young guys coming into it. Um, yeah. And, you know, they're, everything's quicker. They're, you know, reflex and all that sort of stuff. Did I still sure. feel that I have the right opportunity? I was going to need some help and really have a really good car and everything right. to win. Did I feel, you always feel you can still win because you've won in the past, but you also start to go, okay, before you think you can win in a bad car <laughs> type of thing. Now you yeah. think I need all the everything, all the tea leaves are in the right position for me to, to yeah. win. So. It all needs to line up. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway. No, fair enough. I mean, I've just seen a, um, just, you know, just a comment pop up. Um, I've got like Bailey Mary Terry again. She said, um, I had my pelvis broken in a wreck and it was, yeah. and it's a tough comeback to walk. Obviously that's what happened to you. And I guess, right. you know, the nature of the injury probably forced, forced your thought process as well. Cause it was, yeah, I've still got the I've still got the plates in the right side. I got one down and one across, wow. and uh, in my right. But I still I still do everything. I mean, we still heli ski and do everything. So you know, still ride bikes and uh, I kind of hung up my helmet on the motorbikes. Uh, there was a couple. I'm more afraid of everybody else, but I also figure I probably don't bounce quite as well as I do <laughs> if I'm on, on a motorbike. But, um, sure. but it just it just it just um, um, you know, I mean, age changes how you look at things and, and so forth and so on. But I, I do everything. Uh, I, in fact, as soon as we're finished, I'm going to work out and uh, hit the gym. And, and uh, but it's it, it's just, you know, it's just a mindset. I've got a bunch of broken bones. And but if but again, if you look back at everything that went on in my career, and where I am right now at my age and what I'm doing and the things I'm doing and stuff like that, I, I have no complaints, no complaints. I was a lucky, I was a lucky guy and, and uh, what a great career and met so many fabulous people and went to so many fabulous places and lived so many, you know, great uh, places. And, and, you know, you look at it and go, Hey, I love what, what racing gave to me. Yeah, yeah, it's um, um, yeah, it's it's not been too bad, has it? It's, no, no, <laughs> it's been pretty good. Just very quickly, again, I'm just going to wind down very quickly. But we've got a couple of things that have cropped up. Um, uh, the uh, guest guest races uh, in the in the DTM. Um, yeah, right Donington, um, not a million miles from from here. Um, Francie, what did you make of uh, Donington? And also, just a quick mention about the eight uh, about driving for Tom Walkinshaw and the Silk Cut Jaguar eighty eight. Fantastic car. It was a fantastic car. I, I drove for, well, it was all part of Tom's deal, but it was the American side of the thing. It was the American team that he had over here doing IMSA that we drove for. And the car was phenomenal. I remember doing the driver's meeting at Le Mans with the five cars and three. It was like it was like as big a driver's meeting as we had in Formula One, and it was just the team. 
I mean, there was, you know, because there was eight, uh, 18 of us with, you know, something like that, or 15 of us in the, in the field. Um, and my, I, I wish I'd done Le Mans a few more times, um, but it was hard with the, with the contract in IndyCar to yeah. get them. Roger Penske was brilliant. He said, go for it. If, as long as there's no conflict on, on scheduling and testing and stuff like that. So he said, go for it. Uh, you know, I love it. Um, but Walkinshaw was fantastic. The DTM, by the way, was Alpha. And, yeah. Uh, Giorgio Piano, had, he had, yeah, he had give, he had been with me in the in the Alfa Romeo Indy car that I drove for Pat Patrick. Okay, right. and uh, and we got along really well. And he said, "Why don't you come over?" And it was uh, Alessandro's Nanini's car. And remember, he had to had the helicopter. Yeah, he the lost the arm. Yeah. So in the car, he had two sequential gearbox uh, shifters. Right. Because he could only go one way. I think it was up. Yeah, I think it was up or back. I can't remember. Um, so you use one gear lever to go upshift, and you use the other lever to downshift, but it was the same way as the upshift. Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, okay. So they both went in the same direction, but there was two different levers so that you could upshift. You were pushing. And I remember at uh, the first race I did at Mugello, in the early, I, uh, at the end of the straightaway, and you got that right hander, and it goes up the hill, yeah. and I and I, I left my hand down because it's a very quick. You turn in gas, but it's a very quick upshift, and of course I downshifted. I didn't upshift, <sighs> and I think I hit like you know whatever eighteen thousand RPM or something stupid or whatever. JoJo said, well, I, I I knew that was going to come, so it was an old motor, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. But Donington's a fabulous track. I mean, a fabulous track. And, and those guys in the DTM, you know, you step into anybody's category. It's, it's, um, it's special, you know, and they're very good at it. Those things were unbelievable. All-wheel drive, you know, uh, the ABS braking, sequential gearbox, which we were still driving, you know, pretty much manuals in the Indy cars and all that sort of stuff. So it was trick. It was trick. Wow. You know? Excellent. So, that's cool. Anyway. Just, sorry about, um, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, 88, you were alongside Thierry Booten and Hans Stuck, two very good drivers yeah. as well. Two, two good yeah. guys. Um, just move on very quickly, just like post racing. Yeah, you went, you joined, you were part of the Red Bull Driver Search program. Was that, right. um, was that one that got Scott Speed to drive in? Yeah. in Red Bull? So, yeah. so I've gotten cool. approached by um, Phil Giebler and Patrick Long about is there anything you can do to help? Uh, the, us Americans get going. And I'd read an article when I was living back in Europe, I'd read an article in the Financial Times about Dietrich Matsushita's and the plans for America. So I called Yost Capito, because Red Bull was a sponsor at Sauber, and Yost was at Sauber at the time. And he says, no, call Heinz Kindergartner. He knows him well. And I know Heinz Kindergartner a little bit, not well. I just met him through car stuff, you know. And he said, oh, call Dietrich. Here's his number. Call him. And I said, well, I can't just call him. He said, if you want to get a hold of him, call him. So I called Dietrich and said, hey, driver search, this is what I got in mind. He said, can you put it in a fax? And I faxed it to him, sent it. He said, come see me. So I went to Salzburg and you know, out to their, you know, outside of Salzburg to the factory or to the, or their headquarters. And we talked about it with Thomas Uberall, and, and, and the next thing you know, he says, okay, we got a deal. Let's go do the driver search program. Now, the driver search program was American. The one I was talking about was American centric. Okay. And they were fabulous to work with. Red Bull was fabulous because they knew so much about doing these events. And here's my idea. And what about this? And what about that? But Scott Speed was one of our first four graduates. Of, uh, or first four that we chose, Patrick Long finished fifth out of the four, uh, out of the whole group. He was fifth, and I had invited some guys from Porsche, Uwe Brettel, who was uh, running their pro. I said, Uwe, you got UPS as a sponsor, and America's your largest market, and you've got no American in the team. And so that's how the whole thing with Patrick Long started at Porsche, was that at that event. Right. Okay. Oh, cool. That's so, cool. Anyway, so that's yeah. anyway, um, and and it's it was a great experience. Learned a lot from Dr. Marco, 
And, uh, you know, it was, it was, everything's never without pain. And there's always issues and trying to figure the right deal. But uh, Scott was a super talented guy, and, and Red Bull got behind him. Unfortunately, it, it didn't pan out the way all of us wanted it. But, no, sure. Sure. But, but it, anyway, that yeah. was it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, just got a few little fun little questions at the end. But one thing I do want to pick up on, um, I think it was Thomas Parker. Thank you, Thomas, for tuning in. Uh, he said, uh, what do you think of um, uh, how Mr. Grosjean is doing? He obviously, he's taken pole and he came second and to come back after that absolutely awful crash um, with the house. Um, that's a heck of a comeback, isn't it? Yeah. Well, good for, I mean, great for him. Obviously, he was talented. I mean, we saw it in various stages in Formula One. We saw it when, when the Haas team was more competitive. Hell, except for the bad pit stop down in Australia, I think those guys would have finished third and fourth, both of them. I mean, or fourth yeah. and fifth, whatever it was. And so I think everybody knew that the guy had the speed. I mean, yeah. given the right right deal. And kudos to Dale, Dale Coyne for putting him in there. And Dale's a great uh, – I mean, he's been a long-time – uh, owner, he's a, he's a great guy, and and um, and I think that uh, Roman will, will Roman will will get him to up their game in IndyCar, which I think is going to be paramount because now they got a guy that can deliver, and he showed yeah. that, you know, yeah, and uh, you know, and I mean, what's going to happen in the next two weeks is a little bit different because now he's going to be a little bit out of his element, but on, certainly on when he hit a road course. Yeah. as opposed to a street course um, in one of those things. Obviously, he, he shown and, and uh, yeah. so I think we're going to see more. I think we're going to see more of it. Yeah, I think, I think someone like Road America is going to be well suited to him, isn't it? That yeah. kind of circuit, he'll, he'll be going well there. Um, cool. Uh, just a very quick little word, Ron. I always ask these like, little silly questions at the end. Quick, uh, quick fire one. Um, what was your favorite Indy car that you drove? That, that one you've got a picture of right there. That, yes. that was a, that was a uh, right, uh, Nigel Bennett designed IndyCar and it was fantastic. The color scheme set, when I first saw the color, I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to wear a gold suit, you know, around, but it, but in the end, it was like once, once you got used to it, it was like, now this is really cool because it really stood out. That was, yeah. But it was a fabulous car. Every time we rolled that car off the trailer, we were toward the front. So yeah. Good car. And obviously it was the car you won the title in and um right. and someone actually actually said earlier that you know um and I fully agree someone actually put in the comments I forget who it was forgive me they said um you know it said that you should have won in 88 you know and you yeah. probably would have done um it could have been the second one but yeah I agree it's a great car I've always loved it <laughs> yeah me too. me too yeah very cool um if you stayed in F1 say up until 91 92 was there a team and a teammate that you would have liked to have been involved with? You know, I don't think that I was in there long enough. I mean, McKaylee was a great teammate, you yeah. know, and I and I really believed if that if Ken had done that deal um, with with Brian Hart and had that turbocharged engine, and he and Tolman put some money toward Brian to develop the thing, um, I think they we could have been. Not necessarily a. Th we would have been more competitive, and I think if that had done, we would have had a chance to establish ourselves and maybe stay. And who know? Who knows? I mean, you can't predict. It, it didn't work out, and on any front, I I can't complain. The move to my IndyCar turned out great for me. Uh, you know, it, it you know pipe dreams to think about what what would have if it could have happened or this. What is it? No, I can't say that anyway. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, what is it if, if uh, uh, what is it? Anyway, never mind. So, if a frog had the wings, he wouldn't bump yeah, his Yeah, yeah. We'll move that. <laughs> if some butts, it's just, yeah, it if some butts were candy and nuts, what a sweet little world it would be, right? That's it, exactly yeah, that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. But um, that's not motor racing either. No, exactly. It doesn't go that way. <laughs> Um, this last couple, what was the favorite track? Favorite track you've ever driven? Spa. Great answer. Spa. Straight Spa. out. Excellent. Yeah, Spa. It, on the North American side, Laguna was a track I did well. Uh, Elkhart Lake was great. Uh, Zazuka uh, in Asia is a fantastic track. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you know, France Grand Prix. I mean, you know, 
there yeah. there's some there's you know probably top 10 would be uh, in that order start yeah start with that group so yeah sure cool um just before we get to the last question i've just seen that thomas parker said he'd love to get a signed signed autograph or something for his dad right. we we'll see <laughs> but yeah okay. thomas, we'll see we'll um, get it worked out okay yeah okay. um last question favorite moment of your career you know I mean, everybody would think that the Indy 500, because that defined my career, and that was probably uh, as cool a moment, you know, to spin and win and come back and, you know, and, and win that race. Um, you know, one that really strikes me, Formula One was starting last and finishing fifth at Monaco, yeah. but racing Keke for, you know, he was an established guy, you know, world champion to, to race with him in, in a car at Brands Hatch you know, in the last lap to be, you know, touching wheels and, and, uh, and racing there. But, you know, there's just so many, there's just so many great moments with some, just so many fabulous drivers that were real characters from Formula Ford races, Formula 3 races, you know, remember the late Gunnar Nielsen, some of the yes. races we had in Formula 3 were just, you know, were just so much fun. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I don't think I'd, you know, but if you had to pick one, you'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say probably the MD 500. No, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> no, there's, there's probably a whole book worth, isn't there? Here's yeah. Yeah, so many great ones. Um, we're going to wrap up there. Um, i have taken over two hours of your time. Um, thank, but, you yeah, very much. thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, personally, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. As I said, I was a huge fan of yours when I was a kid. So, uh, and it's been amazing to hear all the stories and the insights and everything. And um, I think we just want to say that, um, you know, uh, just going back to what Linda Cotter said, you know, she was obviously, you know, you've been a hero to a lot of people. And um, uh, Bailey Marie Terry has said that you made a lot of us race fans. And I um, thank you all very much. I think that probably uh, sums it up nicely. So yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you all. And and I got to say thank you again for everything that went on when I was racing in my formative years in the UK, um, you guys helped mold my, uh, my passion for the sport as well. So thank you. Brilliant. These things work two ways across the pond. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody. Stuff. Have a good one. Great Talk stuff. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Cheers.